Good morning, and welcome to our worship this morning. Please be seated. I've just realised in our efficiency we've forgotten to give me an order of service. Is that a spare one, Derek? Thank you. Welcome to our worship this morning, um, whether you're gathering with us here or whether you're joining us online simultaneously in my wildest dreams or later on, which is far more likely. We are struggling to get it to go live at the moment. Are we live? You don't know. We, it says it is. That's the problem. It tells us it's live. And then you get home and you look at it and you discover it wasn't. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. So let us recognize his presence with us. As God's people, we have gathered. Let us worship him together. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. And we will have our opening piece of music, which is Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise, because Thursday was, of course, Ascension Day. Sorry, the head and the ones was planned. And so let us come to a time of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
And for our psalm today, we will use Psalm 95 on the sheets. Will you please stand as we read this? And we'll read it alternately. So I'll read the plain type if you read the bold. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Please be seated for our first reading from the book of Acts, which Jane is coming to read for us. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. And he said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, through David, foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. One of the men who have accompanied us during the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. The lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we have our second reading, which I think Judith is reading for us. Don't worry. The Gospel is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verses 6 to 19. Jesus has been talking to his disciples at the end of the Last Supper, when Judas has left the table. He then speaks to the Father to commend his disciples to him. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I come from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, 
except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I did not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you want us to know more about your love for us and more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Help us to think about that together now. In his name. Amen. So Thursday of last week was Ascension Day, that highlight of the church's year that everybody remembers, or not, as the case may be. It's one of the problems, isn't it? It's a major fe church festival, but it happens midweek, and so it's quite easy to gloss over it. But Ascension Day marks the end of Christ's earthly ministry, the ministry that began with his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and it is followed by 10 days of waiting for power from on high, to use words from the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. And at morning prayer on Ascension Day, the reading from the letter to the Hebrews includes this verse. Consequently, he, that is Jesus, is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. His earthly ministry might be complete, but his heavenly ministry continues. I find it hugely encouraging as well as humbling that Jesus' heavenly ministry is to pray for us, part of it. And the gospel that Judith has just read for us, as she said in her introduction, is part of Jesus' high priestly prayer, the prayer that he prays with the disciples before going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's a prayer that he prays on the basis of his relationship with God. He speaks about, to God about how, he, how they are one, how they are united and together. He talks about how he has spoken the words of God and how those words have brought people to believe in him. And so this prayer is a prayer that is done on the basis of a relationship. But I want to look at two things that Jesus prays for, for the disciples. And the first is for protection. Jesus says, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me protect them. Now, I'm not a parent, um, but I understand and I have a slight hunch that what parents want more than anything else for their children is to protect them. You want their lives to go well and for them to grow up and to, to develop, but you also want them to become resilient adults who can handle what life throws at them. Protection doesn't mean wrapping up in cotton wool and protecting from everything so that when they are adults, they don't have the wherewithal to negotiate life. It's that tricky balance, isn't it, between the two. And so when Jesus prays to the Father that he would protect, initially in this case the disciples, his followers, but I think us too, 
I don't think that means wrapping us up in cotton wool to lead gilded lives. After all, most of those for whom he prays, most of those who were in the room with him, died as martyrs. So protection didn't mean exemption from trouble. So they are protected in the name of God. Because of the power of God's name, as um, the psalmist says at the beginning of Psalm 54, save me, O God, by your name, vindicate me by your might. But also because being protected in the name of God means being loyal to the name, um, using the same power that's kept Jesus safe. You know, we, I have a first name that I don't use. There was a big debate when I came here and my initials were being, my name was being put on the board as to whether we should put my first name up. And I said, well, no, because if you put my first name up, in 20 years' time, people would say, who the heck was Eleanor Durham? But the thing about my Eleanor is it's spelt differently to everyone else's Eleanor, because that was how my grandmother spelt it. And I, I'm, I'm quite feisty about, if you're going to use my name, please spell it right. And this is, it's more than that that Jesus is saying here. It's about being protected because we have God's name, because we are a part of God's family. And he goes on to say, protect them so that they may be one as we are one. As a little aside, if you're ever wondering why on earth your prayers remain unanswered, be encouraged. Because looking at this, we don't see a united church. We are one flock. We have many sheep pens, but I don't sadly see a vast amount of unity. That prayer isn't answered. It's not surprising that some of ours aren't either. But our unity comes from our recognition of God's name, being protected by that name. So the first thing Jesus prays for is protection. And the second thing Jesus prays for is sanctification. And he says, I am asking you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. In the book of Leviticus, God, through Moses, says to the people of Israel, be holy as your father is holy. Those who are set apart from God are called to do what God wants and to hate, I use the word advisably, what God hates. And Jesus is the most complete version of that that we will ever see. So what do we see in Jesus? We see compassion. We see times of frustration and anger at things being misused. We see care for the outcast and the widow. We see feeding the hungry. We see reaching out to touch the leper, healing the sick, caring for those who needed care. So this sanctification that he prays for isn't about being a cloistered, set-apart life. For most of us, there are people for whom it is, but for most of it, it isn't. It is about living a life that is concerned with what concerns God. Yesterday, a number of us, um, and we owe great thanks to them, were clearing up in the churchyard. And I think that's a really good example of a part of what sanctification involves. It's about keeping things so that they bring honor and glory to God. But as we were doing that, we were also talking about how we could make provision for the bugs and the, and, 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 and the, and the slow worms. Watch out, Kenton Churchyard, they now have homes and other creepy crawlies across the churchyard. Sanctification is about using what we have in a way that brings glory to God. It means living in God's truth, guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth. And that means learning God's thoughts and character, being prepared to follow him at all times and in all places. And Jesus goes on to say, as you have sent me, so I have sent them. So sanctification is to be sent. It's not to be set apart from, for most of us, but to be sent 
into the world to tell God's good news in Jesus. And again, note that the sending of Jesus included suffering, hunger, thirst, difficulty, and ultimately death. Our following and our sanctification may include some of the same. So that's what Jesus prays. He prays for protection and he prays for sanctification. What does that mean for us? Maybe we need to ask ourselves, where do we seek and need God's protection? When I lived and worked in Tanzania, um, I then, as now, looked slightly younger than my years, even more so then. And I was single, and I would go around when I came back to the UK and visit churches, and they would say to me, you are so brave to go to Tanzania. You know, you're going so far away. And I said, no, 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 you're brave to stay behind. I was expected to be a Christian. It was obvious that I was a Christian. I was a I was an Mzungu, um, a foreigner, living amongst the Tanzanian people. I stood out in a crowd quite easily. And I was expected to behave in a certain way, to do certain things. And I wasn't really challenged about how I responded to the challenges of the modern world, because we didn't have any in those days. It was much harder to live here. Ted's nodding his head. Do you agree with me, Ted? Mm. Sorry? Been there, done done that, yeah. So needing God's protection isn't just about, it's about all of our lives. It's about, and it also asks us, how are we called to pray for believers who are also in need of that protection? Because of challenges from without, Believers in North Korea, Afghanistan, the Yemen, Pakistan, for example, Indonesia, or within the challenges that most of us face day by day about how we follow and obey. And also, I think this passage calls us to ask, how are we being called to live in holiness? What is God challenging us to do, to be, or to change today? Jesus prays for us to be protected and sanctified. Who, I wonder, are we called to pray for in the same way? Let's bring our thoughts before God in a moment of silence. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Lord, help us to walk in your light and to follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and affirm our faith together in the words of the Creed on the back of the orders of service. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated. Sandra, hang on a second. I'm going to do something first. Please be seated. If you look on the communion table, hopefully you can see a stack of marriage registers. In fact, two parents um, of those who've, whose names are in these marriage registers are here today, two sets of parents. The church has been involved in witnessing and solemnizing marriages since the 11th century, and we've been required to keep a written record since, the, um, since 1610, and that remained until 1836 when these books were created, 1836. And so for centuries, we've recorded them. We've got a whole stack of them in the safe here from um, Lidford, King Weston, and Kenton. Here we have acts of loving commitment made by friends of successive couples and witnessed by friends and family and recorded by the clergy. And, but that has now changed. As of the 4th of May, following the introduction of the Civil Partnerships, Marriage and Deaths Registration Act of 2019, as of the 4th of May, we no longer use these books. Because now, all marriages are recorded by the Registrar General. There will still be a piece of paper to sign as a part of the um, marriage service, but the recording of them has gone to the Registrar General. That happened for a number of reasons. One of them was there was a growing feeling that mothers should also be included. As you will know, it's only fathers who are recorded here. Um, but there were other reasons as well. So we're going, as we close our registers, yesterday, while people were working outside, the first thing I had to do was draw diagonal lines through all the unused pages. It was very exciting. And so we're going to formally close these registers and mark that event. Um, so I have two prayers for us. Actually, I, don't, I have, sorry, I have three prayers for us to use. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of love. And remember the many men and women who have stood in our churches to make their vows to one another. Those whose names are written in these registers and those before them. We thank you for the joy and fruitfulness born of their marriages. We remember those whose faithfulness was lifelong and who are now at rest. Those who were widowed and bore long grief or who married again. Those whose marriages begun in hope did not bring joy or which were ended in ways they did not intend. We remember, too, those fathers whose names are recorded here and the mothers whose names are not, the friends and relations who bore witness to the married weddings and the clergy who solemnized them. Give us grace to remember all that is past with thanksgiving, with love, committing to your care and healing sorrows that which cannot now be changed in this world but which will find peace through the grace of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. God of order and peace, we thank you for the means by which the turnings of our lives are faithfully recorded, and for those who kept the records with diligence, for the means they offer for truth-telling and justice, for the record of memory of generations past. As we commit these records to the archives, help us to leave the past in your care and renew our trust in your changeless mercy that brings us life and wholeness. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And loving God, we pray for those who will come into our churches to declare their love in time to come. For those planning weddings here, in coming years, for those whose love is yet unkindled and the generation still stored up in your bounty, that they may live and love in the freedom of your creation. May this place be to them a sign that their earthly love 
is a sign of your eternal love that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and that holds us in life until we come to the kingdom prepared for us in him. Amen. And Sandra is going to lead us in our intercessions. Creator God, maker of the stars and sea, and of all the good things which we thank you for, and all the things that terrify us, help us through your dear son Jesus to put our trust in you as we live through these sad and difficult times. We pray for the world, our precious and unique blue planet, so tiny and fragile in the infinity of space. We ask your blessing on the G7 Climate Change Summit. May the politicians who attend it think of all the world's children and grandchildren and not wed themselves to short-term nationalistic gains. As we struggle to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic, may the lessons we are learning that we cannot isolate ourselves from other people's suffering be written on our hearts and never forgotten. We thank you for all those who have worked themselves to exhaustion and those who have freely shared their discoveries to help others. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the church throughout the world, for Christians and Rohingya Muslims facing persecution in Myanmar, in Pakistan and India, for Christians and Uyghurs in China, for Christians and Yazidis persecuted by ISIS. We pray for justice and peace for all suffering minorities. We thank you, Lord, for our own peaceful church in Kent and Mandeville and its green surroundings. And we remember with gratitude our forebears who built it and cared for it. We ask you to bless our attempts to make its interior more useful and welcoming for sharing the gospel and our efforts to make the churchyard a haven for wildlife as other habitats around us are being destroyed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own country. Lord, we are so grieved by the number of people in our land so destitute as to need handouts of food, especially the parents who go hungry to feed their children. We pray for those driven to depression by the hard-hearted way social support is now administered. We pray that as a nation, we may avoid cynicism and our politicians will act against corruption in all its forms so we can regain trust in our democracy. In this Dementia Action Week, we pray for the sufferers, their carers and the researchers who are working to understand cure 
cure and eventually prevent this affliction. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves. In silence, we bring before you all the worries that lie heavy on our hearts and thanks for all the good things in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, accept these prayers for, for the, the sake, sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. And we're going to have King of Kings, Majesty. collect for today. Risen, ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praises into one, we pray as our Saviour has taught us, our Father in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And this final hymn, I think we have to stand for, and you may well want to hum. Crown him with many crowns. I don't know how we can do it without singing, so we'll have to hum. Should we stand for crown him with many crowns? promise you. I just don't know when. Thank you for coming. For those on Kenton Electoral Roll who have access to Zoom, the annual meeting is following at 12 and hopefully you received an email with details of that or some other means. And Claire has some paper copies. If you're not able to come and you didn't get the email but you would like a paper copy of the annual report, Claire has them with her. So please do speak to Claire. Um, Next Sunday, we are in King Weston outside. This is a statement of faith for Pentecost with Holy Communion. And we are outside here in Kenton for faith and fun in the afternoon. And on the, this week's bulletin, I forgot to put worship on the 30th of May, which is in Kenton Village Hall with the Methodists. So let's pray together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.